Hold your spot in Matthew chapter 14 and Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 47. And before we read, I just want to share something with you. While driving in Pennsylvania, a family caught up to an Amish carriage, an Amish carriage. Uh, the owner of the carriage was obviously uh, had a sense of humor because he attached to the back of the carriage a sign that was hand-printed that said this, Energy efficient vehicle, runs on oats and grass, caution, do not step in the exhaust. <laughs> I thought that, that was a pretty good one, so. Mark chapter 6 and verse 47, if you'd stand for the reading of the word, we'll read a couple verses here, and we'll pray and, and get on with the message. Mark chapter 6, verse 47, and when, he, when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land, and he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up, uh, went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this morning. I thank you for this day that we could be alive and, and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on this Sunday, the Lord's Day. Father, help us to be in tune with the message. Help us to be attentive to what you would have us to hear. I pray that you would empty me of myself. Fill me with thy spirit, Lord. Give me power to preach and boldness to say what you'd have me to say. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move upon the hearts in this room this morning. If there's a soul here that is not saved, I pray today they would call on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And Father, I pray for that Christian who's struggling. I pray this message will help them be an encouragement more than provoke us uh, to do more for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. The title of this morning's <coughs> message is Toiling and Rowing. Toiling and Rowing. The last few weeks we've been going over this story, uh, but now we're directing our uh, 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 attention to Mark's account in his gospel of the story. And we know that there, uh, uh, we know that Jesus was feeding the 5,000. Quick review. I know you guys are probably going to get tired of this by the time I'm done. Uh, uh, Jesus was feeding the 5,000. Uh, and he told his disciples and commanded them, constrained them, pleaded with them, said, get into the ship and go before me to the other side, uh, to Capernaum, which was across from the desert in Bethsaida, and so uh, in that wilderness area. So the disciples go out. They're about three miles from shore. The time that they went out was about even, the evening. Uh, so it was dark around 6 p.m., 7 p.m., somewhere around there. And the disciples go out, and then within three miles from shore, it was about roughly six to seven miles that go across the, the Sea of Galilee uh, to the other side. Uh, the wind was contrary, a storm brewed, and a great wind was coming. The disciples were exceedingly fearful. Uh, Jesus went alone on top of the mountain to pray and was watching them in there the whole time, right? We went over this. And so Jesus came to them in the fourth uh, hour of the night. So the disciples were toiling and rowing all night. Jesus didn't come to them until the fourth hour, meaning from 7 p.m. all the way to uh, any time between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in that fourth watch. If you break those quarters down, that's the fourth watch of the night. So the whole night, the disciples in the midst of the sea are toiling and rowing. Toiling and rowing, not going anywhere, but continuing all night toiling. And remember that Jesus showed up in that fourth watch. And it may seem that when God gives us a command, God gives us an idea, and we run with it, and nothing happens right away, uh, we may think, maybe that wasn't God's will. Maybe it wasn't God's will. God told us to cross this sea. God told us to go to the other side. And that he's going uh, to send the multitudes away, right? He just got done feeding the 5,000. Unbeknownst to the disciples, he went up into the mountain to pray. Uh, he didn't tell them that the disciples that were doing that. Their only thing that God told them was to go over to the other side. To go over to the other side. And in the midst of the sea, they're toiling and rowing all night. Uh, maybe wondering, is this really what God wanted us to do? We looked last week and said, did, was Peter really obedient when he got out of the boat? And I told you no. If you look through the context back in Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 14, we find out Peter didn't want to obey the will of God, and he didn't have that faith 
in God, not from taking his eyes off Jesus, uh, but you can go back on YouTube and listen to that sermon if you want. Uh, but it may seem that when God gives us a command, just as the disciples in the midst of the sea, toiling and rowing, toiling in our work, toiling in our efforts, that maybe this wasn't what God wanted, as probably thought Peter, and he wanted to go walk out on the water. Uh, but we say, hey, maybe, maybe I'm facing some opposition. Uh, maybe I'm seeing no fruit uh, in my labors, and I'm toiling for naught. But it is not for naught, amen? Uh, the Bible says that we're going to face opposition. Uh, and why do we think this way? Why do we think right when we hit a roadblock, right when God tells us something to do and nothing's happening, why do we think that way? Or it's like, maybe this wasn't God's will. When in the back of our minds, we know that it was God's will. We know, hey, that's what God told me to do. This is what God told me to give. This is where I needed to go. Uh, uh, planning or moving to a different state and maybe something doesn't fall into place as the plan thought it would. I remember my father uh, uh, got uh, kicked out of a Baptist church and voted out because he was too Baptist. And uh, I was a baby at the time, and a man in Wisconsin promised him a job making X amount of money. And he sold everything he had, he didn't have much, and went up there, and basically the job fell through. It was $5 less in the not, er, early 90s of what it was supposed to be. And I think it was might have $12 an hour, and it ended up being like 8 or $6 an hour. And so took on a couple more jobs and got into a church. We lived with a family on a farm uh, for a, roughly about a year or two. And my mom was praying to God that we would have our own place at Christmas time. She said, I just want my own place. I want to have a place called home. And, and, and so imagine in, in, in my father's mind, uh, um, God, you, you, you directed me to go. I'm not saying he went off of God's direction. God directed him to go that way, just as the disciples directed him to go that way. But things aren't turning out the way they seem. I thought this was God's will. Maybe it's not. We're not seeing any results. We're not seeing people get saved. We're not seeing people get baptized. But I thought this is what you wanted me to do. And we think, we're like, well, maybe that wasn't what God really wanted me to do. Uh, and we want to say, hey, we don't see any fruit from our labor, uh, but we're toiling but in, in thinking that it's all for naught. And I'm asking the question to myself, why do we think this way? Why do you think when nothing is going your way that maybe it's not God's will? Maybe I shouldn't have gone up there. I'll give you two words why we think this way. Instant is the first word. Instant means immediate, without intervening, time present, urgent, urgent, now, instant. Second word I'll give you why we think this way, gratification. Instant gratification. Gratification is the act of pleasing either the mind, the taste, or the appetite, which affords pleasure, satisfaction, and delight. So my own definition, instant gratification, the desire for an immediate response for self-satisfaction. The immediate response and a desire for an immediate response for self-satisfaction. Uh, because we need things done now. You ever tell that to a two-year-old? I need it now! What do you want? I just want a cracker. I want a cracker. I want a cracker! And you're like, ah! And like you're trying to get things done, right? Why? A two-year-old. You can't tell a two-year-old. We say, hey, uh, be patient. We need things done now. We need things done now in American society and all throughout society. Uh, I think of fast food restaurants. We need our meal now. Oh, my goodness, you forgot the mustard on my sandwich. Ah, I need this now. Do you really, or can you just get a packet and put it on yourself? Uh, I really need to clean up in this vacuum and, and vacuum this whole area and vacuum this house. Oh, that's okay. Just buy a Roomba. Is that what it is? The automatic vacuums that go and get stuck in places? I need, I need this done now. I don't got time. I don't got time. I need to get a, a, a vacuum. I need to uh, get that, whatever, the Roomba thing uh, out of there. Uh, I don't have time. I need things done now. Can you shop for me? What? Auto, uh, you know, people go to grocery stores. You can buy your groceries online. Have them shop for you. Put it in the back of your car and pay a small fee. Wow. Like, we need things done now. I don't got time. I got to get going. Hey, stay tuned 15 years from now. Pay for a shopping experience. Hey, kids, we used to get into a cart and go in the store like this. Yeah, yeah robots picking all your stuff soon. Uh, I think of uh, a, a house. Like, oh, I'm having, uh, uh, I'm thinking of, gee, I'm not pointing out or anything, but I'm just thinking of having a baby, myself included. Uh, not now, but I'd say when, when we were pregnant, uh, my first one, we're like, man, we need to get a house. We need to do this. We need to do this. Like, 
like, no, let's just chill and rent for a while. But yeah, but if we put our if we put money into a house and we invest in land and all these things, and, and what happens? Hey, 30 days down, 30 days we close in the house, the most expensive uh, item that you'll probably most people will ever buy in their lifetime, and we're like, whoa, let's get it, let's nail it. And then you're like, oh man, what did I get myself into without prior proper planning prevent, prevents poor performance. I'll leave out the other P for the military. Right, so hey, I uh, uh, I need things done now. I think of a car, right? We're saying, hey, I need to get a car now. I need to get it fast. Hold on, why would you spend twenty thousand dollars on a brand new car and spend to have a five hundred dollar a month uh, payment? And you're only making fifteen hundred dollars a month, and then your mortgage is spent a thousand dollars, whatever it is. I'm so drowning, God. I thought this is what you wanted. Like, calm down. Let's save up some money. Let's buy a car, a cheap used car that's about one tenth of my income for the whole year. That's a, that sounds like a good plan. So, instant gratification. We think I'm, trying, I'm, I'm going all over the place. Uh, we think that when something doesn't go our way, uh, that it must have not been God's will. It must have been something else. And we think and want uh, things to turn out right when, right now. I need to see results because that's who we are. That's human nature. I'm a salesman. If I if I talk to a customer at a store, I can sell you a ketchup popsicle to a ladies in white gloves, and I can see the visual manifestation of my work in the selling of that item, right? Uh, but in, uh, 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 think of ministry-wise, you don't see the results right away. And other things in your own personal life, think of some things that you've been through you don't see results right away. I think of children. You put so much time, so much effort, so much money into children. And I hope they turn out right. You need to obey now. Like, I need this now. You need to do this now. And then 15, 20, if your brother Philip, 50 years from now, <laughs> finally he got it. Praise the Lord. Why do we think that way? It's human nature to have instant gratification and we've risen children in America in that type of culture to have an instant gratification right an instant gratification but the Bible tells us in Isaiah 40 31 you don't need to turn there but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles uh, they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint uh, it's easy uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's not easy to renounce the gratifications to which we are so accustomed of getting and receiving. It's not easy to renounce those things. It's not easy to leave America and go into a foreign country and not have a microwave. It's not easy to have food readily available like we do in America uh, and fighting on an empty stomach. Uh, uh, we don't like to wait. We want things now. Uh, we'd say to a child, what? What do we say to our kids uh, when they're screaming or whatever and they want those things, that instant gratification, we say, you have to wait. You have to be patient, right? Who's ever said that to their kids before? You, patience is a virtue. Oh, shut up. I hate that saying, right? <laughs> so we say that over and over and repeatedly, repeatedly. You have to be patient. You have to wait. You have to be like that. Why do we do that to our kids? That's not nice. That's mean. No, it's not me. We're teaching them a principle. What are we teaching them? We're teaching them to be patient, to, to not grow up in, a, in such a way as to expect everything, right? That's what you want to teach your kids. You can't have everything right now. I need, a, I need my burger, and I need it now. Well, I have to cook some ground beef, and I have to put this together. You want to help me cook, whatever it is, right? Uh, so we can't have all these things right now. I really want, I really want this now. Well, I, I need to see this now. I need this. I, I know you told me to go here. I know you told me to do this, but I need to see what it was that I did for my labors, and I want to see it now. I want to have that instant gratification. Amen. So uh, we teach our kids that to grow up to not expecting everything right away. So then the question I ask is, why do we think our heavenly Father is any different? What does he tell us? Wait. Be patient. Now's not the right time. It's all in his time. Right? Uh, uh, you know, hey, I have I have uh, so-and-so in the hospital. I need them to get out now. I've been praying. Why are they not getting better? Now's not the right time. Now is not right now. You need to wait. Be patient. Be patient. Uh, we toil as well in our day-to-day uh, -day lives. Just as the disciples, James 1.3 says, The trying of your faith worketh patience. The trying of your faith worketh patience. That word trying means testing. Uh, uh, a test. 
patience means an enduring under. We don't want to be in a trial and to try and have patience in enduring under this thing. Imagine a 45-pound plate on top of your head. You're not going to walk around very far before you start getting a little uncomfortable. You're not, you're not going to be like, oh, this is great. No, you're going to be like, oh, man, I, really, uh, I just got this thing that God gave me that i got to have. i gotta, I got to endure under it. I have to have patience in it. And the disciples toiling and rowing all throughout the night from 7 p.m. to roughly 3 to 6 o'clock in the morning, somewhere around that time, when Jesus came walking on the water, they were enduring under the ter terrible circumstances of what? Of the waves, of the contrary winds. God, I just want this done now. You told me what I'm going to do. I'm in the path that you want me to go. I can't see the way out. I'm in this storm, but Lord, I know that you're with me. Uh, I I'm going to have faith and rely on that. And, and I'm going to trust you for that. And I know that you're always with me. You'll never need me or forsake me. But I just need to see what's the next step. I need to see I need to see where I need to go. I need to know what I need to do. I need you to tell me where to be, where to go, what to do. Amen? And we think that way. And we say, hey, I, I just need to see it. Why? Because we are humans and we need that instant gratification from the work or the toil that we're in. And we just want to know why. Right? I don't know why I failed third grade and had to repeat it. Maybe on this side of glory, on the other side of glory, I'll find out why. I don't know why. I just did. I just didn't. I thought that's what kids are supposed to do. Kids are supposed to go to school, supposed to learn, supposed to pass the next grade. Right? Am I wrong? Or is that what kids do? Is that what kids do? Like we, we pass grades? Yeah, yeah. So why did I fail? I have no idea. I don't. I don't really know. Maybe I was a dumb kid. I don't know. Uh, don't comment on that. So the, the disciples uh, were under this ter terrible circumstance. They were in contrary winds. They were toiling and rowing, not knowing what's going to come next. But they stayed faithful. They stayed faithful and just rowed and rowed while the winds were contrary. God wanted, when he commanded them to go the other side, that they by faith would trust him. Right? They by faith would trust him, even though he wasn't there in the ship this time, like he was back in Matthew when Jesus was in the boat with them. Jesus went into the boat. The disciples followed him into the boat. They go into the Sea of Galilee. Jesus falls asleep on a pillow. This is, a, I think, the only time in the Scripture we find his heads on a pillow. Um, and, and, and Jesus is sound asleep while the storm is raging. The storm is going crazy. They're like, Lord, wake up! We perish! And he's like, settle down, sees. He calms them down. He tells them to settle because he's the, he is God. He's, he's infinite, holy. And he can do whatever he wants to his creation. And he says... Where's your faith? Why did you doubt? He doesn't tell that to the disciples in Matthew chapter 14, right? Who does he tell? He tells Peter because why he got out of the boat. That was last week's sermon. So even though he wasn't there, God wanted them to be obedient. They were obedient to what God was doing, the work that he told them to do. What was the work that God told them to do? What was the, uh, the command that God gave them? Cross over and go to the other side. I know you don't know what's going to come. I know because if I would have told you, you wouldn't have gone into there in the first place. And doesn't God do that with us? And when we come into our, our lives, we just we live life uh, to, uh, uh, toiling and rowing. That literally means constantly distressed. Constantly distressed. We have people in this room who are constantly distressed. Uh, uh, who need a lot of prayer. Why? Because they have back pain, knee pain, uh gum pain, eye pain, hand pain, knee pain, everything, they're constantly distressed. The world's constantly kicking them down and pushing them and grinding them down, and the devil does the same thing. So when we come into the church house, we need what? Encouragement. We need uplifting, edification from the pastor, but each from one another as members that are fit and fit, fitly framed together as a family. Amen? So for all night in the dark, they were constantly distressed, toiling and rowing bombarded with waves, bombarded with the ship tossing up and through the swells and the waves and all that. No sign of hope, no sign of end in sight. They're just trying to get to the other side by faith, believing in God, but Jesus commanded them to go that way, right? Jesus said, go that way. Uh, th then if he said to go that way, then it was God's will for that storm to come into their lives. That was God's will. Even though they wouldn't have known it, it probably wouldn't have gone by if God told them beforehand. But God commanded it. It was God's will that that storm would come. It was God's will that they wanted to go forward. And that's what he wanted them to have them do. In God's eyes, that storm was the perfect timing. Think of that. At that time, this portion of scripture, at that time was the perfect time 
that that storm would come into their life in God's eyes. In the disciples' eyes, it was a very inconvenient time. Very inconvenient. Lord, it's nighttime. We've worked all day. We were supposed to get a break on vacation, and now we're doing this. Uh, and, and, and that's usually how life is most of the time. Um, there's never a good time to get a flat tire. Anybody have that? I can't wait. Uh, you know, this would be a perfect time for a flat tire. No, you don't have that. There's ne I've never heard of anyone say that. There's never a perfect time to stub your toe in the middle of the night. There's not, I think at 3.33 when I wake up to go to the bathroom to have a stub my toe. That'll be great, God. If you can make that happen, Lord, please, just not this time. You know, I don't want to step on a Lego. There's never a good time for a flat tire. There's never a good time to stub your, your toe. There's never a good time to get a paper cut. Like, oh, I'm blind now. I have to go to a wedding. What does a wedding have anything to do with your hand, by the way? Uh, but I don't know. But there's never a good time for any of those things. That just happens that way because why? That's life, and God knows what we can handle. Amen? Amen. Uh, so God says, hey, uh, there's never a good time for bad news. That's why they call it bad news. Bad news is not good. It's always bad. It's never good. Hey, I got some, you want the bad news or the good news? Oh, man, just give me the bad news. All right, you're fired. What's the good news? Hey, we don't see you anymore. Oh, man, that's terrible. You know, hey, I don't want to hear that stuff. It's just bad news. You know, we got to let you go, man. I feel like I'm going to get a hernia up here talking. I better slow down. Woo, let me get my breath. Bad is never good, but God, who is omniscient, ultimately knows uh, when, he knows where, he knows how, he knows the duration of our trials that are needed in our lives to get us to the place of what? Trusting him more. That is what God is interested in, is having us trust him more. Uh, that word, uh, 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 toiling and rolling, I said, was a, a constantly distressed uh, that word uh, patience in James chapter 1 verse 3, the trying of your faith uh, 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 worketh patience. That patience also means cheerfully, cheerfully waiting, cheerfully enduring. When was the last time you saw a grown man get a flat tire on the highway who was excited that he got a flat tire? Enduring under this trial. No, I don't think I've ever seen one. Uh, my wife and I, when we were dating in Seattle, I cut across, man, about eight lanes of traffic to get to this exit, and I did not see clearly a median in the road, and it was probably like that tall, and I just, and that, this was in my Grand Prix, and I'm just like, Rrr! you know, my turn signal's on, boom, and I'm just like, um, I think I hit something. She's like, yeah, and she's waiting for me to freak out, and I'm just like, well, this is what God wanted. And I never, I totally forgot about that until my wife brought it up recently. I was like, wow, I did that? She's like, yeah, like my dad would be flipping out. You know, he'd be like, oh, no, all these things. Like, I don't know. I just, I was just like, well, it's a flat tire, it's a flat tire. You know, it came at a bad time because it's always a bad time. It's never a good time for a bad time. That's just how things go. That's how life is. And let's just change it and move on with our lives. And don't call me an idiot as your boyfriend because I'm trying to impress you in my new car. Right? I just, I, let's just go. Let's just move on from this. I'll change it. Just stay in the car. Put your face in your phone. Don't, don't worry about what just happened. So to cheerfully, by faith, wait on God during our hardest times. You know, I, I imagine that in this storm, must have been quite some storm if Peter was scared of some wind, the boisterous wind and the waves. It must have been quite some storm for the apostles who were fishermen to go on this boat and toiling all night. It must have been a long time all throughout the night. I like to sleep throughout the night. I don't know about you guys, but I like to get some sleep. I'm like Matt. I don't, I don't know where he's at. I don't know if he likes to sleep or not. Uh, but God is more interested and developing our faith than he is relieving us in our distresses. Amen? God wants to develop your faith more than pulling you out too soon out of that distress that God has you in, in his perfect will, knowing that he'll deliver us through. So what's the point? What's the point of all of this? Uh, go back to uh, Matthew. Actually, no, go, uh, we're in Mark chapter 6, verse 51. Uh, Mark chapter 6 verse 51 And he went up unto them into the ship And the wind ceased And they were sore amazed in themselves Beyond measure and wonder Who in the world is this man? Back in Matthew 14 I'll show you one verse here Matthew 14 and verse 33 I'm oh, sorry verse 32 And when they were come into Who's they? Jesus and Peter when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they, the other eleven, 
were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. A little bit different than when Jesus was asleep during that storm, and they said, and Jesus called the storm, and they said, What manner of man is this that the winds and seas obey? What was the whole point of God bringing them through this and doing this? What was the point? To ultimately worship and glorify God and say, Thou art God. Thou art the Son of God. We know this to be true. We've been proven. We've done some trials. We've had some hard times. Uh, that's what the disciples did once they got into the boat, once Jesus got into the boat. They came, they worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. And I want to share with you what God gives to those who wait. What God gives to those who wait. Number one, there is great blessing in waiting. There is great blessing in waiting. Lamentations 3.25 The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. Isaiah 30 and verse 18, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait uh, for him. God gives us grace through the toiling and rowing in our lives. And when we finally get through, we finally get to the other side, uh, God does what? Or what What do we do? We worship and exalt Him and praise Him for His mercy. Uh, happy are we when we wait on God just as the disciples did. Go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. <clears throat> John chapter 6 verse 21. The Bible says in John 6, 21, Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Just, hey, we're in the middle of the ocean. Jesus got in. We're on here at the other side. Whoa, is that what trusting in God's like? Is that what God's going to do for us? God's going to bless us, and so we don't even have to keep rowing to go to the other side. God says, hey, thanks for your faith. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to stop this. We're here. We're already at the other side. Praise the Lord! You know, they, they worshiped him some more because of his great grace. And knowing that their faith did not fail when God told them the will that he wanted them to go. And going that way and saying, I'm going to trust you by faith. I'm going to stay in the boat. I'm going to continue in my trial, in my testing, and being patient, enduring, and waiting on God by faith. And I know that he's going to deliver me through. Even though I can't see the other side. Even though I don't know my own circumstances that's going on. But God knows. And when God got in the boat, they worshipped him because of who he is. And God blessed their faithfulness and waiting for him and said, let's go to the other side. I'm already done. God blesses when we wait. Amen? God blesses when we wait. Uh, happy are we when we wait on God. Uh, that the, When the Bible says they willingly received him into the ship. What does that mean? Uh, they gladly delighted in bringing him into the ship. They knew. They said, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Like, literally, thank you, Lord, for coming into this ship, delivering me from this trial, delivering us from this trial. Go to uh, uh, Psalm chapter 30. Psalm uh, chapter 33. Psalm chapter 33. Sorry, I'm not trying to have you turn too many places, but you got to see this. Psalm chapter 33. Thank you for turning there if you can. If you can't, just follow along with my voice. Psalm chapter 33, verse 20. Psalm 33, verse 20. Short little chapter. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Our heart shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted in His holy name. Let Thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope. In the secondly, those what God does for those who wait, there is great help in waiting. So there's great blessing in waiting. Secondly, there's great help in waiting. Help from the Lord because why? He is our shield. We talked a few Sundays ago. He is our buckler. Therefore, uh, when I put my faith and trust in the buckler, in the shield, he is a defense for me. He is a help for me. We can trust him, amen, because let God be true and every man a liar. Thirdly, there is great rejoicing in waiting. There's great rejoicing in waiting. Read those, read those verses again. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. That's the help. Uh, verse 21, for our heart shall rejoice. That's number three, rejoice 
in him because why we've trusted in his holy name how can we rejoice in waiting how is it fun to rejoice when i'm pregnant my sweeter my feet are swollen and all these things because i know in the end god is in control and i'm going to have this baby and he's going to give it to me amen i was thinking about my wife because a lot i think three of the four that we have were done during the summertime i feel so bad for her but don't blame me uh that's all in his time so uh that's what i told her because, how can we rejoice in waiting? Because we can trust in His Word. We trust in His promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my Lord. And I'm saying that a little too high. But we stand on the promises. Uh, we, we glean from the promises. And when we're going through hard things, we go back to the promises. And we cling on to those promises and say, God's Word is true. God's Word is a help. God's Word is going to bless and take care of me. Amen. Number four, there's great hope in rejoicing. So not only is there great blessing, not only is there great help, not only is there great rejoicing, but there's also great hope in waiting. Uh, uh, Romans, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I promise this will be the la uh, second to last place we go. Romans chapter 12. Hold your spot in chapter 8 if you're there. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. The Bible says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Kind of sounds familiar what we're talking about. Continuing instant in prayer. You know, it's interesting. I didn't see the disciples praying in any of this. Uh, I don't know if they did. I'm, I'm assuming they may have or crawled out to God or at least were terribly afraid. But there's great hope in waiting and to rejoicing in that hope God gives uh, 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 us hope. Romans chapter 8 and verse 25. The Bible says, uh, But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. I have a hope. I can't see the hope, but I'm going to wait patiently for that hope because I can trust in my Lord. I can rejoice in His Word. I know He's going to give me help in this time, and I know that He's going to bless me if I wait and endure under this trial by faith, waiting on God. And number five, not only is there blessing in, uh, in waiting, not only is there help, not only is there rejoicing, not only is there hope, but there's great mercy in waiting on God. God gives mercy according to the hope that we have in Him. It's, it's, the, it's the measure of faith that we all have. And in the end, what happened? In the end of the story, what happened? They got to the other side. Everything was okay. They made it to the other side, even though when we're going through our trials, or we're going through something that God said, hey, this is my will for you, and we're not seeing results, but we wait patiently, God, in the end, is going to get us to the other side. Because why? He's God. He's Almighty. Amen? So they trusted God by faith to deliver them through the storm, by staying patient uh, in the boat, the place of safety, by faith. By faith. That's the most. We also must, by faith, continue to put our trust in the one who will send us, who will put, put us, who will place us where he wants us to go, send us where he wants to go, and puts us where he wants us to be and obey his commands. Stay in the boat. Go to the other side. By faith, trust me. Trust me on this one, guys. I know what's going on. I'm the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the end, they said, Thou art the Lord, Thou art the Son of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. Lastly, George Mueller, a uh, famous man that had a lot of uh, different things that we're not going to go into his history. George Mueller said, God delights to increase the faith of his children. We ought... Instead of wanting no trials before victory, no exercise for patience, to be willing to take them from God's hand as a means. I say and say it deliberately. Trials, obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. We should take them out of his hands as evidence of his love and care for us in developing more and more that faith which he is seeking to strengthen in us. Wow, just nailed it on the head. That's why I had to give him that, that quote because that is beautiful. You can get weary in the work, but don't get weary of the work. Galatians chapter 9. Galatians chapter 9. Through God we have hope. Amen? Through God there is hope. And I, and I, I pray and I ask for God to give you hope during this time, whatever season of life, uh, of the trials, of the, the defeats, or whatever it is 
uh, the exercise for your patience in your life right now, church, because I love you and I want to pray for you and you hired me to pray for you, uh, to not get weary in the work. Don't get weary in the trials. Just stay faithful to God. And that's what he desires. That's what he blesses. That's what he helps. That's what he rejoices in. We can have hope in and we can have mercy in and, and helping, uh, uh, I'm sorry, and, and by faith trusting the Lord Jesus Christ that he is going to see you through. Amen? So don't get weary in the work. Don't get weary. But uh, you can get weary in the work. Absolutely. You go to a job, you get weary in your work. But don't get weary, especially of the ministry. Don't get weary of that work. You can get weary in it, toiling and laboring, and get weary in your trial. But don't get weary of it because it's all of God. And that's what he has planned for you. It's his purpose. Amen. Illustration. There is a marker on a rock near the top of Mount Washington. Marking the spot where a woman climber lay down and died. Uh, she was so close to the top that she could almost hit it with a stone's cast. A hundred steps more and she would have reached the shelter she sought, but she did not know this. Disheartened by the storm, beaten in uh, body and distressed in spirits, she was at the end of her courage. She lost hope. So uh, she could not see a step ahead, so she lay down and died. 100 steps from her goal. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 9, I had you turn there, the Apostle Paul writes, we will get tired of doing the work of God, no doubt, but Paul exhorts us in verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. While on this earth we go through trials, but one day, just as we were singing in that song a moment ago, we won't have trials no more. We won't have to worry about things anymore. We won't have a hard time anymore. Second Thessalonians 3, 5, don't turn, they just listen. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ, patiently looking and longing for His coming. Philippians 3, we're in Galatians, go to Philippians, a couple pages over. Last verse I'll have you turn to. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press for the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us live by faith and do His blessed will, but until then, let us be patient and are toiling and rowing. Will you be resistant or will you be per, uh, patient and persistent in that toiling? That's my question to you today. I encourage you to be patient in the toiling. Let's pray.